not California, but like uh, this year something changed. A uh, snow lost uh, and a uh, snow and I I went uh, last year not California. Uh, the mountain, the mountain uh, no water. Now um, snow, everything the lake, the mountain snow, snow up up there. And uh, Sacramento, Sacramento um, water, uh, Sacramento River, and uh, water same uh, San Francisco. Uh, something changed a lot by the earth, the world. And uh, water, uh, water from uh, snow go to, uh, from I to water and go to uh, Sacramento River. And water come to here, something changed. And, uh, people know three years they don't have snow, but this year I have snow, and something changed in the earth too. Well, that, that's a really good point, and um, I think I think the bottom line is a lot of our infrastructure. If we're gonna if we're going to build up our cities on on the coast, we're gonna need to we're gonna need to, we're gonna need to change a lot about the infrastructure, the wa you know the water, the electricity, how we generate electricity, how we get around. Um, whether we want to emphasize public or private transportation, um, uh, how how we build homes, where we build homes, um, this is a you know a, a much bigger um, much bigger conversation. Um, and uh, we're good for that around here. Go, yeah, we can go. All. It seems that the landowner who wants to make a profit on his property never really completely dots all the I's and crosses all the T's about what really needs to be done to achieve that. Right. Do you know about the thing with cumulative impact with the planning department? We never seem to be able to bring up cumulative impact. What is that? Well, they always say, no, you can only look at the impact of this one project. You can't look at the impact of oh, oh, the right. trend of all the projects. Right. Um, that, that's Very frustrating. That, so actually, that's kind of related to our next, um, our, our, our next installation of this project. Which we're going to be working on at the end of the year, which is about whether the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, um, is is a tool that local governments can use to uh, to address uh, uh, the impact of the pro uh, project on the environment while the environment is changing. And CEQA was written in the '60s and hasn't really been updated to account for climate change. And this is going to be something that we're going to be reading about more and more over the next you know, couple of years and, and, and decades, how to, how to, how to reimagine our uh, environmental rules. Backing up on what uh, Otto talked about, cumulative impact. Um, I've got a map on it from a new book on, new thing on planning I've got that shows from six to market, in four blocks of six and market, there are 14 projects that have been approved or in the pipeline brand new now. And there's four or five more in the pipeline coming up in six months to a year. So that's a lot of new construction for not low income housing going up around our area. Well, and yeah, if you want to talk about housing, we can talk about housing. Um, uh, we we do a lot of reporting about housing issues, and we want to we want to do it again. Um, this is in, in the presentation, but um, this issue right here, uh, uh, we did uh, two Stay years right there. ago. Oh, okay. Um, two years ago, um, uh, creative solutions to the housing crisis. It was in conjunction with a um, a, a, a <coughs> long conference that we had, uh, actually at Fifth Market. Um, First floor of the Chronicle building, um, and it was all about how to rethink the problem of affordability and trying to get the warring sides of, of this issue to come together and agree on on anything. <laughs> um, and it was really it was actually a fun exercise because so much of, of the conversation has been, um, you know, the developers versus the activists. Um, and they, they talk within their own communities, but they don't really talk to each other, um, and there's no, there's no agreement. So um, we came up with a list, in this issue, we came up with a list of nine different ideas for 
creative solutions. Um, and, and some of it had to do with zoning, some of it had to do with um, creating uh, you know, new funds for construction, also had to do with rent control. Um, and uh, we weren't necessarily prescribing any one, any one solution. Um, but it just, it, I think it opened up the space for um, answering the question of whether or not we really can do anything or whether it's a fait accompli. Um, so I just have a couple more. By fait accompli, you mean that there's a permanent you're going to be at the balance of housing? Right, and that the, the, the under, uh, you know, that the, the, the under um, uh, provision of housing is going to uh, accelerate as the you know the the, the kind of the rising uh, tide uh, you know sinks a lot of a lot of boats. So you know people who have lived here for standard of housing might start to deteriorate, and standards of housing below median will deteriorate even more. Yeah, and and um, and uh, you know you see it even in this in this neighborhood. You know there. This, there used to be a lot of affordable housing in this neighborhood, and there's, there's much, much less of it um, just because of market forces. And well, the force is going to cause if, if, the, if it goes to stuff, California goes down in the water, if you've got the over to the dip way too much. Over what? If there's, California goes down in the water, it's because the city done way too much, and you stress the land out. Mm -hmm. You stress the land out. So the sub infrastructure in the I mean, it's just, it's, uh, every time you build something, you, 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 get, you loosen the, the earth and Part the more, and loosen the soil. And well, there's, and there's no way to step back. That's, I mean, that's really, that's really interesting, and it's, and it, that was also kind of beyond the scope of our, of our project. But the engineers for these, for these developers, the, the developers pay the en their engineers really well um, to come up with all of these um, schemes for protecting. The, protecting the land against uh, future future sea level rise, and they have these machines that basically look like um, bi you know big hammers. Um, they're like they're like uh, uh, little uh, Tomcat uh, uh, trucks with these big hammer heads on them, and they pound the land. This is what they're doing on Treasure Island. They just they go like two feet pound the land and then move another two feet and pound the land, and this is supposed to make the, the soil uh, less vulnerable to the earthquake. Uh, That's silly. And, and, the, and, and this is what they're... Rock, rock, And apparently they have you know, enough scientific uh, studies behind this method, and, and, it's, and it's now used pretty widely. Um, but it, it is really interesting to know that it's... It, the, the, the lengths to which they go and the expense that they, they go to to re-engineer the land to try to fight against nature. To pull off the big lie. I, just, I, don't mm -hmm. think I like what they do in Italy. What? Um, they inject um, um, what they call hydro hydraulic cement into land to stabilize it because uh, like in Venice, because Venice is sinking. I mean, Venice has been sinking for 250 years. Wow. Um, and now they're pumping gallons and gallons of this hydraulic cement under Venice to stabilize the land underneath it because more and more often, there again, you have sea level rise of the Mediterranean Sea, keeps putting down, keeps putting most of Venice four or five feet underwater and it's getting in all their really, sport, really important buildings. This is just the tip um, of the iceberg in terms and, of what's coming. Uh, but I think it's really, really a unique way because they're also doing that now in uh, Miami and some places they're doing it, and in other areas that have really loose soils, they're putting this hydraulic cement in, and what it does in a nutshell is it hardens up the ground and it doesn't absorb anymore, which oh. is really good. We just don't do it here, uh, which eventually we will have to. Uh, there's gonna be, there, well, uh, I. One of the one of the things that we never anticipated, we, we you know we made a prediction that in the coming decades, um, the taxpayers were going to have to increasingly pay for some of the mistakes that the developers are making now. Well, this is a new possibility for that. They made those bonehead mistakes. They made billions of dollars. They pay. No, 
Well, well, how did you vote on Measure AA this June? That was the that's the big cleaning up the day. Yeah. And the two measures coming up in November to raise the sales tax one and a quarter percent in San Francisco. Sales tax. So, so the the regional measure AA passed by seventy percent, and that puts a, a $12 a year tax on every parcel of property, even parcels that are miles away from the bay. And meanwhile, um, the, the developers of all of these um, massive tracts, uh, you know, who are, who are uh, spending hundreds of millions of dollars each on each development, they're also paying $12 per year per parcel um, to help uh, with bay restoration and building uh, Buffer wetlands and levees and reshoring re, uh, up uh, parklands and, and building uh, and, and possibly building seawalls um, in order to protect the development that's already there. So, so the answer is we are paying for it. We're going to be paying for it uh, in the next in the next couple of years because of what of how we voted as a community last month. And those assessment fees are passed dollar for dollar on to renters. Oh. And they're not covered by rent control. Yeah, and $12 is not a lot for any landowner. That's $12 for $100,000, I think, or something like that. Um, just another thing, I think, that then we can move on to your jail issue. I think it's something we need to really focus our attention on is the um, what is considered affordable. Because the mayor's office of housing considers affordable roughly 35 to 40,000 a year income. That's affordable. If you look at the average income of this neighborhood, you're looking at 20,000 a year. That price is the 22, 25,000 people in this neighborhood out of the housing market. I got a project for you. Where um, there are, I mean, there are exceptions to that. We have HUD housing and some uh, government subsidized housing, which people can still get into. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we have a mayor that says, well, we're going to build 30,000 affordable housing units so we can uh, control the, and, and the homeless crisis. We have homeless people that make zero income. How are they going to spend thousands of dollars for our apartment or hundreds of dollars for a hotel room right. well, it's all they the don't have any income? Right. It's in the, all in the definition of affordable. There's, there's a, there's a whole, I think you got to check the whole, the whole there's, city. There's low income, okay. very low income, and extremely low income. Okay. And um, most of the people that I know that are homeless fit the extremely low income, right. and we're priced out of housing. Well, one, yeah, one. Even one, in this neighborhood, you're priced out. One definition, which is not the not the definition that usually holds sway in these programs, is no more than thirty percent of your income. If your income is zero, you don't pay anything. If your income is uh, $10,000, you pay th uh, $3,000. And then you have the, the other $7,000, which is probably not enough to live on anyway. Um, but it, at least it's not everything. HUD has even zero income people have to pay $75 a month. It went up 25 well, We're going to have to totally rethink. Oh, it's up to totally 75 Republicans in Congress raised it $25 so, and they had $75 a month that a zero income person has to pay for rent to live in a HUD housing. If somebody actually has zero income, there's a point where you have to address their lack of income. Yeah, it's called the destitution. So. They used the word, they used the word um, affordable housing when they first came up with it. So to me, it was like an idea to go do something to help the people because there's a whole lot of homeless people. But then, as time went on, and I got involved with various groups and going to the city hall, but I couldn't find the day to use that word. Because I think it threw a lot of people off, especially if we didn't have nothing. You know, the word affordable housing means, oh, we can afford it. But then when it turns out that no one can afford anything, and uh, that's a disgrace. That's well, we did a whole issue about um, affordability um, and the. Uh, uh, many dimensions of it in, in this uh, issue that, uh, over the winter. Okay, some Marva said triggered a, a thought about the cement they're pouring. When you make cement, what you do is you take silicate, you heat it up, and you 
you take carbonate and you heat it up and you turn it into silicate. And in the process of doing that, you release a lot of greenhouse gas. And it seems to me that I'm thinking about this, that when they, normally when they look at buildings, they look at the greenhouse gas generation of the building after it's up, what, you know, the, the greenhouse gas generated from heating it and from air conditioning it and for lighting. But it seems to me that there must be just massive amounts of greenhouse gas caused in the actual building of the building just to get it off the ground. Yeah, we could talk for hours about this. I mean, we've done some reporting on that as well. How, how many um, years? If, I'm guessing that it's years. Certainly, I have the blue heat. You could certainly have the blue heat come to work, greenhouse gas, ozone tearings. Um, and very, now, all my life, since I was a kid, up to this very time and hour, these things were not even an issue, and now all of a sudden they are. And it's like, to well, think about storm, like, what is that? They started, they started using petro, petroleum, what, pet, what do they call it? Fossil fuels? Petrochemicals. They really started leaning, we really started leaning on fossil fuels around 1850, 1860. It's kind of a recent thing. And it's kind of actually only recently that people start to realize there's a problem. You know, um, <clears throat> they went from sailing ships to steamships yeah. to oil-based ships. The steamships. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try to take less than oh, that. Oh, but speaking of that, like well, I mean, I, if we I, go I, sit there and have a two-hour discussion. Yeah, I'm glad as well. Well, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm. At, I'm at. I was at an inner solar today, oh. and I take. I keep an eye on that. I go every year as, as a well, expo patron. And one of the things is they have got um, they've got thin film photovoltaic. It could be molded onto sail, you know, or, or onto the decks. And now we could actually solar power shipping if we, you know, you know, if if we redid a lot of things. I mean, because this started when we went from sail to steamship, you know, to uh, you know, to, uh, to to uh, the warships needed oil around uh, 1905 or something like that. This is this is uh, an area very close to my heart. I started out as an environmental reporter, and alternative energy is. Um, a, a really underappreciated the 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 technology the technology they have now is really underappreciated. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just um, one thing I wanted to point out is um, Hygin is uh, is uh, among other things. Even uh, she she wrote this article uh, on the website, uh, and she is also doing um, videography. Um, so she's taking taking photos. Uh, I probably neglected to mention this. If anyone doesn't want to be photographed, just let her know and, she, and she'll yeah, take those that, pictures. Yeah. Continue with pictures, please. Okay. <laughs> well, it's great. I took a ton. You look um, great on camera. <laughs> but she's, she's also, what she's also doing is, you know, what, this is, you know, we want, to, we want to have conversations and we want to offer um, the, the people we meet with to uh, give to, you know, after having, ha you know, um, sparked some conversation, um, uh, uh, have have some kind of one-on-one -on -one time with the with the camera, and we've uh, we've produced a couple of videos already in some of these community meetings where um, you just get up and uh, you you talk about the one issue uh, that you care most about and that you think is undercovered um, and that needs more uh, more media attention, and we look at those and we um, assign some of those to be written about by our staffers and by our interns and, and, and our journalists. So it's an opportunity to kind of give us back ideas. Um, so if so, what we typically do is we do those after the meeting and we can stick around for afterwards and um, she can just you know video, video whoever wants to talk to her one-on-one. -on -one. So set you up with a microphone. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, that's the one. Uh, I have a room called 930. That's great. Um, and, uh, I, just, I have to leave at 9 because I have a I take care of my housekeeper. Okay. Um, but no, uh, I, we, a lot of our us in the room have done interviews with Central City Extra and others before, so I don't think that would be a problem. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. And if we, can, if we can't get together tonight, um, I put my phone number down on your slide that's
Great. Um, <laughs> so, uh, 